What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about Ozempic and related weight loss drugs. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. So many of you have been asking me my thoughts on weight loss drugs like Ozempic. Now we've had like weight loss drugs in the past that really focused on the mechanism of action being on trying to increase metabolism or energy expenditure and really just didn't really have great results with them. And the ones that did have really good results, like for example, uh, one drug called DNP, which is an uncoupling agent, which increases energy expenditure, also very, very dangerous, very dangerous. And so this new class of drugs, which are what are called GLP-1 mimetics, they focus more on the appetite side of things. Now what's GLP-1? GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide one, which is a gut hormone secreted in response to feeding. And it has a few different mechanisms of action. Uh, it slows down the rate of gastric emptying, uh, it increases insulin secretion, and it acts on the brain to inhibit some hunger-related hormones. It also acts on ghrelin to inhibit the actions of ghrelin. So basically, you feel more full, and you feel more satiated, and you don't have the same desire to eat. Why not just give people GLP-1? Well, GLP-1 has a very, very short half-life. It tends to get degraded by proteolytic enzymes very, very quickly. So what some of these GLP-1 mimetics, uh, especially semaglutide, which is the most effective uh, GLP-1 mimetic on the market, they modify a few different residues on the protein sequence of GLP-1 to make it so that it has a better binding to albumin, because albumin carries it in the bloodstream, and to make it so that it's much more resistant to degradation. And there are a few different forms. There's not only a subcutaneous injectable form that people usually get once a week, there's also an oral form. Now typically, oral proteins are not bioavailable because they are degraded during the digestive process. So you have stomach acid, which unfolds these proteins, and then you have proteolytic enzymes in the gastrointestinal tract, which basically chop them up into individual amino acids. And so by the time those get into circulation, it's no longer the intact protein, and it doesn't have an effect on whatever you want it to have an effect on. However, the oral form of semaglutide actually has some modifications to different amino acid residues, including one that is modified with a sort of kind of fatty acid called SNAC, uh, which protects it from acid and proteolytic degradation during digestion. It's actually pretty brilliant. Now you do have to take a larger dose of the oral form of it because it is still less bioavailable than the subcutaneous injection. But it is cool to see that they made an orally bioavailable form of semaglutide uh, because when I first heard about this, I was like, well, that's BS because you know it's hard to make proteins absorbable but it appears they've been able to do that, probably because this is already a pretty short protein. It's only 31 amino acid residues long, whereas many proteins can be hundreds or thousands of amino acid re residues long. Now, how much weight loss are we talking about and what are some of the outcomes of using semaglutide? Well, in research studies, people tend to lose about 15% of their body weight, which is very substantial, and they tend to improve almost all their markers of metabolic health, like HbA1c, they lower their blood glucose. While GLP-1 does raise insulin in the short term, so it raises the amount of meal-secreted insulin that you produce, it tends to lower basal levels of insulin in the long term, and that's because people just lose so much weight that it lowers your basal levels of insulin because you're more insulin sensitive. Now, this is an interesting side note to people who believe in the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. The carbohydrate insulin model of obesity says that if you increase meal insulin, uh, it traps fat in fat cells, which makes them inaccessible to the rest of the body, and you overeat in response because your body thinks it's starving. So basically they're saying that insulin makes you hungry. Well, this drug decreases appetite while increasing insulin. And even though it increases meal secreted insulin, people lose substantial amounts of weight because da 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 da, they eat less. So this one drug in and of itself refutes the entire model 
of the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity because you secrete more insulin, but you're less hungry. You secrete more insulin, but you lose weight. So anyways, side note, that makes semaglutide basically the nail in the coffin of the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. They also find that it improves most markers of cardiovascular health. And once again, there's nothing unique about what it's doing. Because people eat so much less, because they feel more full and have less appetite, they consume less calories, lose more weight, and because of that, their cardiovascular markers improve. And I mean, if you look at the research studies thus far, semaglutide basically crushes every other method of weight loss that we have out there, diet, exercise, and other weight loss drugs, and produces pretty similar effects to gastric bypass surgery without the gastric bypass. Now, what are my thoughts on semaglutide as a treatment for obesity or just for weight loss in general? Well, I think a lot of people look at these drugs as, well, you could just eat less, so why don't people just do that? Well, we do know that people who suffer from obesity don't have a slower metabolic rate, but we do know that they don't tend to have the same response to satiety signals as, say, lean people. They also tend to get a greater reward from food. So I do think this is a reasonable treatment for people who have been trying to beat obesity for a while and haven't been having much success. Now, one thing I will say because the mechanism of action is by people eating less, if you take this drug, lose weight, and then stop taking it without modifying your lifestyle or your habits or behaviors, you will likely put it all back on. Now, that being said, perhaps semaglutide, by getting you to eat less, starts to naturally build in some of those habits and behaviors, but if you're basically taking this so you can eat small amounts of junk food and then you go off of it and now you're just eating large amounts of junk food, the likelihood that you're gonna put weight back on is pretty high. And if you don't struggle with appetite, then you don't really need this because you could just eat less. Now, one thing I have heard is people say, well, you know, my metabolism is slow or my metabolism is broken and that's why I need semaglutide or I need Ozempic. Well, if your metabolism is slow or broken, Semiglutide is not going to help with that because it does not increase energy expenditure. It simply decreases energy intake. Now, a lot of people ask me about side effects. To date, most of the side effects appear to be GI related. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those seem to resolve themselves usually within two weeks of starting it. It does make sense if you're on a drug that slows gastric emptying, you're going to feel like pretty, like not great uh, initially and might feel kind of nauseous but that tends to resolve itself inside of a few weeks. Now, one thing I will say, because it slows gastric emptying, if you take other drugs, you may need to talk with your doctor because it could affect the time release of the other drugs into your system because gastric emptying is being slowed. Now, there have been some people who said, what about thyroid cancer? What about some of these other cancers? There's no real good human evidence to support that. There are some rodent studies where they give very high doses and they see some cancers form. But keep in mind, if you give a high enough dose of anything in lab animals, usually you can see something weird happen. So those aren't a big concern for me now. It's worth monitoring and seeing if it shows up in some of the human trials. But right now we haven't seen that. I personally think this drug should really be reserved for people who have really struggled with obesity. If you're taking this drug to lose five pounds, I don't think that's a reasonable way to do things. Again, you could simply eat less uh, exercise and you could lose that weight. This really should be reserved for people who have struggled with this, who haven't been able to manage it with nutrition and exercise, and we should keep those drugs reserved for these folks, especially because they're so expensive and right now, insurance doesn't really cover them unless you are, in fact, type 2 diabetic, which, in my opinion, people have asked me about, should insurance cover this? Should the taxpayers cover this? It's easy to look at these drugs and say, well, people could just eat less. The fact of the matter is we've been telling people to eat less and move more. They haven't been doing it, and processed foods aren't going away anytime soon. So... This drug is a very effective treatment for obesity. And while 
you may not want to pay for it or have insurance companies pay for it. Guess what they are going to pay for? Heart attacks, cancer, and all other metabolic diseases related to obesity, which is going to be far more cost than if this drug was just covered for people with type 2 diabetes or obese. So one of the problems is you can be obese, and if you're not type 2 diabetic, you may not get this drug prescribed for you. So my hope is that it becomes more accessible and less expensive for people with obesity who may just be borderline type 2 diabetic but not completely type 2 diabetic. I realize in the fitness community, my view on this and my take on this may not be popular because we tend to be like a, you should just grind through it. But I think not everyone is wired the same and I used to definitely have the attitude that it's just discipline, discipline, discipline. But everyone suffers with discipline in some area of their life. Some people suffer with discipline in their personal relationship. Some people suffer with discipline financially. Some people suffer with discipline in their job. And some people suffer with discipline when it comes to their food intake or exercise. And so if we're going to judge one, we should judge all of them. The fact of the matter is nobody's perfect. I've met some really, really great, wonderful human beings who are obese. I think we should have similar compassion for them while still acknowledging that there is a personal responsibility component to it. But thus far, based on me looking into these memetics of GLP-1, I'm very encouraged by them. They appear to be very effective treatments, but I don't know if it's the cure for the obesity crisis, simply from the perspective that unless the drug regimen is maintained, I think a lot of people will end up putting this weight back on. So this needs to be prescribed in conjunction with still encouraging lifestyle modification. All right, guys, if you liked the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you next week.